Or what if we were to tell you that scientists have absolutely no idea how old the universe is? That might be a bit sensationalist, as we do have some idea, but we don't know for sure. And more importantly, we don't know why we don't know. The first reasonably accurate calculation for the age of the universe came in 1958 from astronomer Alan Sandage, derived from measuring the universe's rate of expansion. There was a margin of error, but it was calculated that the universe was roughly 14.5 billion years old, give or take a billion years, with scientists believing that the best estimate is 13.8 billion years. For nearly 50 years, this age of the universe was accepted. The science improved, so too did our calculations, and that margin of error became smaller and smaller. Then, in the year 2000, a new method for measuring the rate of expansion of the universe was created. At first, this was great. Because of the margin of error, both methods offered a possible range for the age of the universe, and those ranges, they overlapped. But as the years went on, and our measurements became more precise, those ranges shrank in opposite directions, resulting in two different answers. The discrepancy in the two different calculations is known as the Hubble tension. And it's getting worse. Recent data from the Planck Observatory has only further widened the gap between the two values. This means one of two things. Either the maths that has been double-checked innumerable times is somehow wrong, or our current understanding of physics is even more incomplete than we realized, and there's new physics out there for us to learn. To determine the age of the universe, we need to calculate the Hubble constant. This is the unit of measurements that describes the expansion of the universe written in kilometers per second per megaparsec, and we promise that all of this sounds more complicated than it actually is. You'll get there. Basically, if we can measure how far away a star is and how fast it's moving, we can figure out how long it took to get there. If you knew a car was traveling away from you at 60 miles per hour and was 60 miles away, then you know that it's been traveling for an hour. What we're doing with the stars is basically the same calculation, just on a really really much bigger scale. Oh, and also the maths is made more complicated because of how the universe expands. The Hubble constant is expressed in kilometers per second per megaparsec because the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. So the further away from us something is, the faster away from us it is traveling. This is all well and good, but how do we actually measure how far these objects are away from us. Now, this is where we get the distance ladder, a series of observations and calculations that builds upon one another to measure distances further and further away. First, we begin with the local universe, local in this instance referring to objects within the Milky Way. Now, if you hold your finger in front of your face and then close one eye and then open the other eye and close the other one, you'll notice that your finger moves from side to side relative to the background behind it. The closer your finger is to your face, the more this is going to switch when you move from one one eye to another. This observed displacement of an object against a background is called parallax, and it happens because your two eyes are in different physical locations. Because the shift is greater the closer an object is, we can use this same principle to measure the distance from Earth to objects within the Milky Way, which is super cool. All you need to do is replace your finger in our demonstration with some distant star, and replace your eyes with the view from Earth at opposite ends of its orbit around the Sun, a distance of approximately 300 million kilometers. By measuring the shift from those two locations, we can calculate how far away it is. Because the parallax of an object gets smaller the further away it is, to the point of being imperceptible even with advanced technology, a new system needed to be designed to measure the distance of objects even further away from our galaxy. This brings us to a special type of star known as a Cepheid variable. Cepheid's a type of bright, pulsating star, and in 1908, American astronomer Henrietta Leavitt discovered a direct correlation between how bright a Cepheid was and how far Whilst it was pulsating. Because these two values were directly proportional, we could measure the apparent brightness and the pulsation period of a Cepheid that was tens of billions of light years away. The Cepheid's period would tell us what the star's actual brightness was, and its distance could be determined by comparing that to the apparent brightness. This made Cepheids invaluable for their use as standard candles. Stars come in all different shapes, sizes, and brightnesses, but a standard candle is an object whose luminosity is always known. In this case, case as a function of its pulsation period. There was just one other step before scientists could begin using these candles to measure even greater distances across the universe. First, they had to use parallax to measure the distance of Cepheids within the Milky Way. The relationship between the period and brightness of a Cepheid was known, but they needed the parallax measurements of nearby Cepheids to create a numerical base that they could then use and extend over greater distances. Unfortunately, Cepheids become too faint for us to see after about 100 million light years. Now, that may seem really far, but it's only about 0.1% of the 
width of the universe, so we are going to need another technique. And this brings us to the final rung on our ladder, Type 1a supernovas. A Type 1a supernova occurs in binary star systems where at least one of the two stars is a white dwarf. Because there is a fixed critical mass at which a white dwarf will go supernova, all Type 1a supernovas should have the same peak level of brightness. The problem is that while we know this is true, we haven't seen one of these supernovas up close, so we don't have any way to know what that peak brightness level actually was. To solve this problem, we needed to find galaxies in which a 1a supernova went off that also contained Cepheids. Using the previous method, that we could calculate the distance to that galaxy using the Cepheids. Once we know how far away that galaxy was, we could also use the distance and the apparent luminosity of the supernova to determine the actual luminosity of the supernovas. With our value in hand, we could then locate 1a supernovas that occurred in galaxies much further away than we could see Cepheids and use the apparent brightness and actual brightness to calculate the distance away. Because these supernovas are so massively bright, this allowed us to measure distances up to a billion light years away. The first real consensus reached using this method came in 2001, when the Hubble constant was measured at 72 plus or minus 8. Our measurements have become much more precise over the past two decades, and the most recent calculations using a distance ladder in February of 2022 gave a constant of 73.4 plus or minus about 1. This is a much smaller range, and well, therein lies the problem. The cosmic microwave background is the first light created in the universe, originating from when the universe was only 370,000 years old. Before this, the universe was too hot for atoms to form, leaving it essentially opaque. When the temperature cooled enough for the first hydrogen and helium atoms to form, the universe became transparent and light could be emitted. The CMB is only detectable in long radio wavelengths of light that reach us from every direction. The temperature of the universe at the time this light was first emitted was imprinted on the CMB, and at first it looked like it was completely uniform with the temperature of just under 3 Kelvin. Now that we have much more sophisticated equipment, we see that the CMB actually looks more like this. The darker blue images on this image represent the coldest temperatures, while the red represents the hottest temperatures. Those colder regions show the areas that would have a high enough density of the newly formed atoms to build the first stars. Essentially, the CMB is a 13.7 billion year old blueprint for the construction of the entire universe. To give you an idea of just how incredible it is that we can even detect and decipher this blueprint, the difference in temperature between the coldest and hottest points in the CMB is only 200 microkelvin, or 0. 0002 degrees Celsius. It was also discovered entirely by accident. Everything within this blueprint can be described using six parameters. The ratios of matter, dark matter and dark energy, the shape and structure of the universe, and the rate of expansion of the universe. When we compare the CMB to our best model of the universe, the data lines up almost perfectly. Since we already have values for five of the six parameters, we can use all of this to calculate a value for the rate of expansion of the universe, the Hubble constant. While measurements using the distance ladder date back to the 1950s, using CMB to calculate the Hubble constant is a much newer method. The first such calculations came in 2003 using data from the then-new Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. They measured the Hubble constant at 72 plus or minus 5, perfectly in line with contemporary values given from the distance ladder. A few years later, the Planck Space Observatory was launched to take measurements of the CMB with a much higher degree of sensitivity. Planck was decommissioned in October 2013, but it wasn't until 2018 that the final results from the team were published. That result was a Hubble constant of 67.6 plus or minus 0.4. This no longer matched the distance ladder's newer result of 73.4, and that discrepancy, the Hubble tension, is highly statistically significant. All right, we've laid it all out, so what does it actually mean? Because of the Hubble tension, the age of the universe is uncertain. The ages calculated by those two values differ by about a billion years, which is over 7% the entire age of the universe. And we really don't know what's causing it. The first possibility is that something within the distance ladder is incorrect. Since each step builds upon the previous one, any mistake would then propagate through the rest of the results. Even if our calculations involving Cepheids and Type 1a supernovas are correct, if the initial measurements using parallax were wrong, it would cause 
everything else to be wrong as well. This means that if there is a problem with the ladder, there's no way to easily determine where the mistake lies, and every part of it needs to be measured and calculated over and over again. It could also be that the problem isn't with the calculations themselves, but something about the method itself is fundamentally wrong. The much more exciting possibility is that the calculations using CMB are wrong. That would mean that something about our best current model of the universe is either incorrect or incomplete. There are a lot of theories being thrown around about what could be causing this difference, but thus far, nothing has been tested. Currently, it seems more likely that the issue lies with the distance ladder, specifically with the Cepheid variables. It was speculated that the Cepheid measurement system was biased bright, meaning that we are measuring them as being brighter than they actually are. Because uh, we can only take images with limited resolution at massive distances, it's possible the light from a Cepheid and another nearby star were essentially overlapping, making it look like a single star with a higher apparent brightness than it should have. This theory was proposed when scientists decided to try to use red giant stars as standard candles instead of Cepheids for the second rung of the distance ladder. Using this method, they calculated a value for the Hubble constant that was no longer significantly different from the one found using the CMB. Our understanding of the universe is constantly improving, but as we learn more, we often find things that we previously believed to be true are actually wrong. It was previously believed that Earth was the center of the solar system, and the Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe. Even the idea that Earth could be millions or even billions of years old is relatively new. These discoveries are exciting because they give us greater knowledge about the universe. If it turns out that our distance ladder was incorrect, We'll probably know very soon. One of the missions for the James Webb Space Telescope's first year is to examine Cepheids that were previously imaged by the Hubble Telescope. Because of the incredible increase in resolution provided by James Webb, we should be able to determine whether the Cepheids were really biased bright or if the cause of the Hubble tension lies somewhere else. There is already some preliminary data from James Webb that has been used to check this hypothesis. While the initial results don't show any difference from the measurements taken using Hubble, the data being collected was calibrated for an unrelated mission, and so it's not necessarily indicative of what the final determination will be. We can only hope that once James Webb completes this mission, it reveals that our distance ladder had been correct all along, and it is the Hubble constant derived from the CMB that was incorrect. If that's the case, hopefully it will lead to the discovery of lots of new and exciting things in the world of physics. Thank you